Um, when I hear sounds, it's like I can see the shape, I can experience the shape and the yeah. the three. It's almost like sound becomes like three dimensional. Um, yeah, exactly. And then you kind of, when I listen to a piece of music, I can kind of walk around it. It's almost like a like a cathedral. Like you know, uh, Goethe. He's like a I don't know if it's German or French philosopher. Um, he said um, architecture is frozen music. And um, Whoa. yeah, Holy shit. yeah, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and I always say um, making films or even playing music uh, feels like sculpting time. So when I hear a piece of music, it can feel like I'm. Just I become like a cathedral, not just like walking inside it, but the, the cathedral itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can actually perceive one sensor with another in a sense, because mm -hmm. all the sensors are unified as one, right? So yeah, and the That's movements the too, movements okay. are like music. Like when I, yeah. when I see like people playing basketball, it's, it's like jazz to me, you know, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah um, exactly. <laughs> Even lifting weights, like the rhythm of lifting weights, like dance and like... Yeah. And when I see images, I, the, obviously I hear music and I hear like quote unquote sound because I think the only reason why I can edit videos is because I learned the violin. <laughs> So in, in a way, meditation, especially Vipassana, um, the, the sort of the deconstructive aspect of meditation, it's all about stripping away all your uh, sensory inputs for, for, uh, for the time being, right? That, again, that's why you go to yeah. a silent retreat. Or well, some people go to a dark room retreat. They even take away your sound and everything. Oh, I didn't know they do that. Yeah, they do that. They have a dark room retreat where you can't see anything or you can't hear anything for like 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like they're restricting movement too. Like the first thing you do in meditation is to sit still. So they're stripping away your inclination to move. That's one sense door right there. And then you know you close your eyes and take another sense door. Um, yeah, so it's deconstructing all your different sense doors, and then understanding the fact that they're all constructed, and then you put them back together. Yeah. Yeah, that's the entire path of meditation. You know, the emptiness and form. That yeah. Helps. The interplay between emptiness and form. Sometimes the seeking energy, like before you um, completely lose the center, there's going to be waves of uh, energies going in, like in and out. Like sometimes you feel like, okay, there's nothing to do. You feel very equanimous, and then um, there are going to be other phases where you're going to come back to seeking again. Uh, probably, mm -hmm. yeah, I can't say that for sure for everyone, but most likely uh, they're going to be phases where you're going to be seeking again, and then phases where you're just going to be in dark night where you. You don't even want to seek, but you're feeling terrible, terrible, and then you kind of want to surrender, and then you go kind of going back to equanimity, where it's just like you feel pretty good, and then you don't want to seek, uh, but uh, you feel like everything is just happening for you, everything's going well. You're neither seeking nor not seeking. Yeah. It's like how much do I control attention, or how much do I allow attention to to do its thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it you know, it's like I can yeah. point attention to like systematically scan the body. But there's like a feeling like attention wants to just go exactly. wherever it wants to go. So I don't know. It's like, you know, what's yeah. the right way or, you know, yeah, it's, a good it's question. like I, I can follow left to right, mm -hmm. left to right, you know, pixel by pixel. Or I can just follow what's coming up. And it's like it's everything everywhere. It's like <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So ultimately speaking, um, whether or not you set intention to scan the body, whether or not you direct your attention or not, or just let the attention flow. They're actually the same thing. You can say like both of them are just happening by itself. Even the intention of trying to scan like part by part, trying to like direct your attention like hardcore, um, is happening by itself. And if you just let go and let the direction wander, that's also happening by itself. Or you can say that 
you know, trying really hard to seek, or just in general, you know, that question could be applied to the entire path. Trying really hard to be a seeker, sitting down every day for five hours in a very masculine fashion, like you said. Um, there's no different ultimately than letting go and letting things just take over because the sort of the, the, the ego's will and the, let's just say the nature's will is actually one and the same. It's just sort of, the, you can feel this tug and pull, but this tug and pull is just the contraction and expansion of the universe anyway. So on, on the path, it's always both and neither. You're, you're both seeking really hard and neither seeking really hard. And you're, you're, you're both seeking and not seeking at the same time, regardless. So like the, that, that question, it ultimately gets resolved. Yeah, that's the same question as like, you know, some, somewhere down the path, you're going to, I'm pretty sure you experienced this. And a lot of people do. They're like, okay, am I doing this for the ego or am I doing this for truth? You know, if, if I still continue to do what I used to do for like, quote, for quote unquote ego, is that going to get in the way of my practice? Should I just let go of doing all this ego stuff? Yeah, those questions are, are, are just dualities. They're just thoughts. Things are just happening and then we attach those thoughts to it. Okay, now I'm trying to do Vipassana. Now I'm directing my attention. Now I'm doing the ego stuff. Now I'm surrendering. Um, oh, this is better for my spiritual progression. But those are just thoughts. It's just happening anyway. But ultimately, uh, awakening is transhuman. It doesn't care about your personal agenda. It's going to unfold at its own speed. You know, fabbing five times a day versus once. It doesn't give a fuck. The most important thing is just find that balance. Find the middle way between effort and effortlessness. That's really the, the most important thing in meditation. It's kind of like playing music, you know, like you... Um, you want to find that sweet spot, or even like athletics, because you're an athlete, right? Like, it, when when athletes go into a free, uh, flow state, they're they're actually trying really hard, but at the same time, they're not really trying. It's not like they're just not doing anything, right? But then um, it feels like it's effortless, right? Yeah. So it's the balance between effort and effortlessness, uh, or between like stillness and movement. When you go from A to B, you're actually not really going linearly from A to B. You're actually like moving in all directions while at the same time you're standing completely still or you can look at this as a kind of like a codependent rising kind of situation you know trying and not trying uh, being free having free will and determinism they're actually codependent rise that's more like on a metaphysical level yeah but um, uh, as far as like practical level the practice goes you can set intentions to just be more like systematic on your, your scanning okay at this sitting I'm gonna just go head to toe part by part and just try to direct my attention in the way that I set my intention to, you know, going cast style, like, you know, from head to toe. Or there are going to be sessions where you can be like, okay, I'm just going to kind of do freestyle scanning or freestyle noting, like, kind of like open awareness noting. They both have their benefits. The more you, the better you get at, you know, systematically directing your attention, even though on ultimate level, that's also happening by itself. But if you say intention to like, you say kind of like practicing scales on, 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 the, on an instrument. If you practice scales hardcore, you know, for a little bit, it makes like, you know, playing the concerto easier too. Uh, athletes that get into a flow state, they didn't just get there immediately, you know, went through years and years of, you know, hardcore repetition, training, uh, lifting. Uh, same thing with like noting. If you want to do like free flow noting spontaneously, you have to set up the right condition. You have to practice noting manually first before noting can start to do itself. When you uh, set your intention to scan your body, like, you know, systematically, that's going to carry over to how well you do on the free flow noting or how expended you can feel when you sort of do the surrender kind of practice. Because the more you contract, the more you can expand and surrender. So they also go hand in hand. So I will have some sessions where even if you don't feel like doing it, if you're like, maybe it feels a little bit forceful. Um, you don't want to do it all the time, you know, but, um, you know, on some sessions or maybe even if you do like two sessions a day on one session or half of one session, you can set your intention to just really sharpen that air of attention, really sharpen that um, direction of attention, that laser beam concentrating power and then letting it go. How important is it to scan every part of the body or can you just kind of go through the same parts, like just the head or just the spine? Okay. How Have you been to a going car retreat? Yeah. Yeah, I, I went. Uh, a few years ago, yeah, okay. yeah. So you've been, so you know how to do the body scan, okay? So, um, well, I, I think the body scanning, I mean, no technique is the best. You know, every technique has its like strength and weakness depending on an individual, right? Yeah. So, one of the advantage, you know, for some people, some of the time for the body scanning is that when you scan your entire body, first of all, you're training your mind to 
to really concentrate when you like scan your entire body i'm sure like in the going car retreat you realize how like exhausting it is kind of it's like a boot camp for the mind it's really like a workout for the brain so you want to get that full body workout so just scan the entire body also really trains your concentration power it's a lot i say a lot quote unquote easier to just focus on one area but then if you just focus on the entire body like becoming aware of picking up all the sensations in every single square inch of your body and down to the microscopic components again you don't want to do that every sitting because i see a lot of people doing that every sitting year after year and then they're not getting anywhere because they're still like just becoming better vipassionalizers and better body scanners they they're, they're still not letting the the, the meditator go and right? letting the direction of attention um relax the, the direction of attention because ultimately that's what it's about really. So I'll, I'll say that it's quite crucial in some parts of your practice to scan the entire body in as fine grained detail as possible, just as a workout for the brain. All of your traumas are actually stored in the body, it's like on the conventional level of the Mitsu, like all your emotional traumas or your conditionings and all your you know, shadows, whatever, um, it's actually just stored in the body, right? So scanning the body from head to toe actually takes care of that in a much broader sense. Let's say if you only scan your head. And some of the uh, traumas are staying in your bottom of your spine. Like a lot of people, they, they go through this kind of linear awakening and they, they realize that there's a lot of tensions in their spine. Like that, that's where a lot of the really deep traumas are stored. You know, like, you know, the root chakras and stuff, especially stuff like dealing with like sexualities and just more primal traumas and conditionings and, and karmas and stuff like that. So like just going through the whole body actually helps you clean out the whole body instead of just staying in one part. So that's another reason why sometimes it's very important to, to just go deep in, into the whole body yeah, and just layer by layer. That's why a lot of people, they, they go through like Kundalini Awakening just by going through Gon Konka Retreat. They never know anything about Kundalini, but then just doing body scanning head to toe, head to toe, hours and hours, day, days by days. Would it make sense to follow and just scan that energy? Like sometimes mm. it feels like it's just everywhere in the, like beyond the head mm. and, and attention it feels like attention can surf that. It can just go yeah, with that's the really good question as well. You can play by ear. Like it's see a lot of people they get stuck in just you know applying the vipassana technique so hardcore that they lose the purpose of vipassana, right? Yeah. So you know sometimes I'll scan my body like you know in a very contracted way, and then in the middle of my session I, I can feel my body start to open up, and I can still even I can feel my you know even the meditator is just doing his own thing. Like the direction of attention is just doing his own thing. And then I'll just write that kind of in the flow state when I'm doing Vipassana. I just write that flow. But it doesn't mean I'm not doing anything. Or well, there are going to be some times when I'm really not doing anything. I'm just like, it feels like I'm not even moving at all. I'm just like, I'm, but then yeah. the body's just scanning itself. Or even later in the path, I feel like the whole like universe or the whole world is just scanning itself. And I'm, I'm not doing any of it. But then there are spectrums of that too. You know, sometimes you're more like in the middle of that. Applying a little bit of effort, you kind of give like your attention a little bit of like a, a womb for maybe directing it a little bit but then it's in a very relaxed and very gentle way and then sort of like a self-driving car but then you still have to like sort of not like completely self-driving yet but you still have to push a little buttons yeah. until finally you know the car is driving itself or even the car even disappears you know <laughs> yeah but then there's a there's a spectrum of that you know that again that spectrum is not different in kind it's just different in degree of contraction expansion difference in degree of effort and effortlessness so the real purpose of vipassana isn't really the body scanning isn't really focusing on like every single particle until you, you you dissolve the body that's just a byproduct the real purpose of vipassana is to see the insight yeah the insight into you know the three characteristics you know imper impermanence uh not self and how suffering relates to those um insights ultimately there's only one one insight that's emptiness so uh, again vipassana means to penetrate and see clearly so you're penetrating the body and letting it dissolve so you can see clearly uh, the inside into emptiness. Oh, this is the body just vibrating, there's no solid self or there's no solid body part, there's no body even. It's just clouds of sensations and there's no self to be found in there. You want to still be able to see that inside even when, you know, the, the, the scanning is kind of like doing itself. Of course, ultimately, even seeing that inside is also just part of the happening too. In the beginning, it feels like you're going to be trying really hard, you know, but then your practice is going to start to catch fire after a while and it's going to start to do itself and then you know you don't even need to see the inside anymore uh, at the end it's just everything is just empty and full simultaneously yeah with shadow work the, the the universe or whatever you want to call it life is always going to give you the exact thing that you need to work with so you have to trust the process you have to have you know quote unquote faith in the process 
Like you yeah. see, to, you start to see that uh, more and more clearly uh, as the the path progresses, as you get deeper into truth, and the more you align to your true nature, that's going to be even more and more obvious. It's like you have a thing in your life, and then this thing happens, this emotional story happens, or something happens with your girlfriend or with your boss at work. In that moment, that's what you have to work with, and then ultimately, you know, like. There's nothing to heal. That's another point I w- w- wanted to make. Is that awakening doesn't happen in time or space, so there is no progression at all. You're awake now or you're never. Right? But on the other hand, here's the paradox again: there is a progression. When you your mind starts to generate stories about like your past, your karma, what my parents did, uh, my exes did this. That's why I'm wounded here now. Um, all that stuff. Uh, yes, it's true on the conventional level, but. On the ultimate level, on the level of presence, there's nothing to heal because there's no time. How can there be anything to heal when there's no time and there's no space, right? So whenever your mind is starting to generate a lot of stories about like you as a character, as a healer, going through this entire process,、uh, linking back to the traumas of your parents and whatever,、um, just remember that whatever sensations arising now, it doesn't have stories. It's just the levels of contraction and expansion. It's a very visceral and, and very embodied feeling of whether you're contracted or not, and you work with that contraction or that solidity right here and now. Yeah, so that's a more like a, a, a more radical and non-dual approach to clinical shadow work. But、uh, again, like I said earlier, my and. and Last call. Sometimes it's still important to work the content. That's why a lot of teachers recommend you going to a therapist. You know, yes, it's one way to just deal with it immediately. Just like okay, the present sensation has no story. There's nothing to heal. There's no such thing as conditioning. That's all just stuff in the dream world. It's one way to attack it. But sometimes that doesn't always work. Like you said, some sensations are so heavy, and、uh, you sort of need to work with the stories. But then the story is also an illusion. But you you work with the illusion to dissolve an illusion until both dissipate. Just like Ramana Maharshi said, you use the thorn of a rose to remove another thorn until they both disappear and they both are removed. Now, when you work with the contractions,、uh, you can either just go in there and deconstruct it and see through the emptiness of it, or you can just let things be exactly the way they are without trying to change you, without any judgments, and just give it love, right? Again, effort and effortlessness, you end up in the same spot. The other half of, I guess, practice that I'm interested in is inquiry. So、mm-hmm. I've been doing a lot of inquiry,、um, particularly with the visual sense. That's something I've been really curious about. Oh, interesting. Like, like seeing. So the other day, I saw this artist who's who's created these sculptures that you put、right. your head into, and the intention is for this sculpture to give you direct perception of non-dual. He's based in LA, and he has these these physical apparatuses that you you step into. It's called zero distance. The forms that the eyes can see, so、mm. the colors and shapes that the、mm. eyes can see that that appears to be out there, but then turn attention into the direction of the, where the seeing is coming from, and look at what the shape and color of that is. And so I I do that. But it's like I don't know what I'm looking for. I think he's pointing to the emptiness of of the seer. But it's like when I'm doing that, it still feels like there's an out there and an in here. I still perceive a perceiver behind the eyes. But when I when I turn around and look at that, I can't I can't find it. But it's like I don't have the insight. It's like I'm expecting something to shift, and it's like I'm still in my behind the eyes. It's kind of like、uh, putting on a VR goggle a little bit. And be like, hey,、yeah. man, you want to understand what this、uh, non-dual thing is?、Um, put on a VR goggle, look at it, look around. Or everything is just mental fabrication. Like this whole VR, this entire VR. Even if you switch games,、um, even the sky, the buildings, all the characters are just you. And then you、yeah. take it off, you still in the VR. Everything is still you. That's your true self of, of no self. Something like that, right? You know, where is the image of the VR located?、Uh, is it in the mind or in the VR headset? Uh, where is the source of it at all? Source of the experience of a VR. Nowhere and everywhere.、Right. Yeah, but I, I think so. What's happening is that you are getting some kind of the the、um, what it looks like to be in a non-dual state. But since your body mind still has solidities left, it's still perceiving through that solidity. 
It's a little bit like people taking psychedelics, but then they experience something like non-duality, but then they report to still like be in the center. Yeah. They're, they're still experiencing the psychedelic trip from the person who is having this trip or from the perceiver. Yes. Yeah, from, still from a center. Yeah. So I guess the, what's happening is that, yes, you, you, I guess you can get a glimpse of quote-unquote non-duality, but of, of course, if you still hasn't dissolved like... The perceiver or the center or the thinker here, um, not to perception, is still not untied. Y you can have glimpses of it through different methods, but then if your brain isn't rewired, it's still not going to be like the full thing or like the, the, the true visceral experience, like moment to moment, like locked in into your, like the deeper region of your brain. So I, I do think like even if people can get a glimpse of it, they still need to like buckle down and put in hours of practice. So I guess it's a little bit like a bodybuilder trying to f know what it feels like to be to run 100 meter dash in like 10 seconds or like what it feels like to like look like Ronnie Coleman. But then when they step out of the machine, they still haven't made the muscle gains. Maybe there are people out there who can just step into the machine and have a glimpse once and then they fully wake up. There are people like that, the people who never done anything. <clears throat> and then spontaneously wake up. Was inquiry a big part of your path? Was that something you, at some points where you got really into it all? Any mm -hmm. koans or anything like that? Uh, I never did koans. You know, it's funny because the the first time that I really understood what koans were was after like my realization. So then yeah. I was like looking at all those koans. I was like, holy shit, every single koan has no answer. And well, you can say every single koan has just one answer. And it's this. It's just right here. Like it doesn't matter what the koan says. Every answer is just what I'm experiencing right now. So... It, the, the funny thing about spiritual practice is like you don't really get it until you get it <laughs> yeah so like everything before you really get it is mental yeah, yeah yeah so then once you get it you don't need to do it anymore right so it's very it's a paradox right there yeah it's like why am i doing body scan why am i trying to like you know inquire into what i am when there is no one here to you know inquire that there's no answer you know that, what i'm saying it's like why am i directing my attention to like scanning the object over there uh, from the observer when neither the object nor the observer exists right yeah so but then you can't you can't really say that until you've really gotten it my method of inquiry is, is actually very direct I don't even ask the question I did a little bit of like asking who am I what am I or, or like when am I where am I I did a little bit of that I found the most uh, direct way to, pr to practice inquiry is just to objectify everything in your direct experience until the subject vanishes mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically everything that you can perceive, you kind of just, I wouldn't even label it. Maybe in the beginning you can label it as, oh, this is not me, this is not self, not this, not that. I can see the phone, this is not self, this is not, not this. Okay, I can see this camera, not that. So it's easy to like label objects like that. But then once you start to go inward, okay, is the body me? Oh, okay, I can perceive the body, I can experience the body, this is not self. So, and you go down deeper and deeper into the, like, the mind, you know, if I can watch a thought, then the, the thought is also not it's also not this and not that you objectify the thoughts also and then you go even deeper now i'm perceiving the thoughts yeah that's cool but then there's still a witness here that's witness, witnessing the thought can i witness the witness can i perceive the perceiver if you can then even the witness is not self okay now your witness started to dissolve and you realize the witness is just solidified sensations that's taking credit for perception which is just happening without a center point without a locus of attention anywhere so you see that that the, that the witness started to dissolve as well and then now you're like maybe oh okay, i'm abiding in like open space of awareness or like i'm abiding in in, in you know the god consciousness or whatever everything is just consciousness but can you experience that if you can perceive or experience even everything is consciousness then yeah. consciousness is also not self so yes. that's, that becomes very, very subtle. So after this point, it's very hard to talk about. And then the perceiver or the subject just start to get thinner and thinner and thinner until you completely vanish or it dissolves into the object. So if everything is the object, then the subject disappears. Or you can say everything is just the subject. You can say that everything is just the self. So that's you know, two ways to perceive the same thing. Like Buddhism talk about like no self and like Hinduism talk about like true self. They're talking about the same thing. That's another way to uh, describe the feeling of doing self-inquiry correctly. So you start to feel like you're grasping air or you're just falling into a bottomless mm -hmm. pit when you just can't find it. That's another way to perceive emptiness, actually, is that the, the process of like not finding what you're looking for 
yeah. is one way to experience emptiness. But then you have you can even go a step further than that and be like, what is this? What is this thing that's like trying to find everything and can't find it? What is this feeling of not being able to find anything and feeling like I'm falling into the void? There's something there. There's an experience there of that, right? There's an experience of not finding anything. There's an experience of unlocatability. Yeah. So then you objectify even that. So you just keep going meta. You just keep looking for that which you can't find. And then you you want to be able to not know it. Not know, even the not knowing. <laughs> and not know it well. Not know it deeply. So you look for what's looking until you can't find that which is looking. And then you look into that. On and on and on. Yeah, because like when you get to a space of self-inquiry. Okay, now I'm looking for the self. I can't find it. Okay, now I'm in this pretty sweet spot where I can't find anything. Oh, this must be emptiness. This, I must be doing self-inquiry correctly. Oh, now I don't have a self. You start to have, you know, you see how the mind starts to take refuge even in that space? Mm. In a very tricky way because the rest of the solidity is still trying to cling on to that. And then you just keep objectifying that. You keep inquiring to what that is. You know, who does that sensation belong to? You know, when is it? Where is it? Yeah, so that's how the mystery just keeps getting deeper. I'm just curious to hear like what, what are, yeah. What do you think about intuition or instinct? Um, or? <clears throat> I don't really think about intuition and instinct. I, I think I've just been always been a very intuitive person. That's why yeah. I don't talk about it. Like ever since I was a kid, like ever since I was doing the bodybuilding thing or um, uh, the pickup or whatever, like the even even on the spiritual path, it's always been very intuitive. One practical uh, tip that, I, that I've been giving recently is just feel the contraction in your body. If something isn't aligned to intuition or like if something isn't aligned to like the flow of the universe, if you feel contracted in the body, then um, just see, investigate into that. Oh. I think intuition is something that just happens anyway. You just kind of have to set up the right condition for the intuition to happen. Yeah. So that's one way to set up the condition is to dissolve the solidity and the contraction and tensions and, and, and the constrictions in the, in the body. Yeah. But you can say that in my state right now, it, the, the, there's only intuition. Even when sometimes I try to apply logic, if I'm doing like an email, like I have to like think about it, it doesn't feel like I'm thinking, it doesn't feel like it's coming from the brain, it doesn't feel like it's something that like I have to try to do, it just happens so... But then you can say that about everyone too, it's just like they have a thought saying, okay, uh, I'm, I'm thinking this, I, I'm planning this, like I'm making this logical or whatever, but that's also just happening by itself. Yeah. <laughs> So it's everyone's operating under intuition anyway. <laughs> it, it's almost like <clears throat> when I hear a teacher point at that, it's just permission to trust what's happening. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, that's a big part of the practice. Yeah, that's pretty much the whole path. Is just to uh, remove the resistance from the what is. That doesn't mean that you you can't feel pain or you can't sometimes feel resistance here and there, um, but then you don't resist the resistance. Like the weather, you know, sometimes it rains, sometimes it, it, it hails, sometimes it, it, it snows, but then people don't go out there and resist the weather. They know that's not them doing it. But they resist the weather that's happening like to their own body or their own mind. And that, that's what's causing the suffering. I guess the last area I'm, I'm curious to hear more about is like, you mentioned a little bit about like porn and sex addiction as part of the, like your, your personal path. And, right. And, and so in some ways I've approached it as like, okay, I noticed the strong urge and it's like, okay, don't judge this thing. It's like, I'm, I can do it if I want to, but then what's here? What's, what's, what's before the impulse to reach out? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the more you practice, the more you're going to have that gap, that space. Um, like even while you're doing it around the action, around the thoughts, the impulses, or before there's a gap where you kind of, you sort of ha have a choice or, or want to do or not and ultimately that that impulse of like okay i'm gonna do it i'm not gonna do it you can actually see that that is also part of the happening but the more you practice the more you kind of rewire that process to work to your favor in, in terms of like realization so yeah like i said like you neither want to indulge nor do you want to um suppress yes. yeah so if you find the middle way between you know suppressing indulgement then um, you're in a good space and the more you practice the more the deeper you get into uh, the, the open space of awareness or like your true nature the, the more that that intention of wanting to do the clinical bad or wanting to do the clinical good there there will start to be kind of automatic 
you just start they, they will just start to like shape itself and be like and then you, it's gonna be like uh, going back to intuition so like i said you can set up the right conditions for the choices to make themselves mm. yeah so one of the ways that personally i did it was i set up the, the right condition by just practicing meditation self-inquiry two or three hours a day that was how my, I set up my condition to let the universe decide what's the best for me. <laughs> you can say that's an act of surrendering as well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, Deshante also said the same thing. He said um, meditation is really not about like what techniques to use or whatever. Ultimately, it's just to set the condition for the universe to do its own thing. Because when the, the universe has always been meditating, in a sense. So when you get into a really deep meditation state, it's actually just you removing the sense of meditation, that the removing the sense of a, a meditator, a doer, a seeker. Mm. Yeah. So the entire spiritual path is about setting the right conditions to allow the what is to happen. Mm. And the reason why the what is in the beginning of your meditation practice might feel like a big deal, might feel like holy shit, this, this is a crazy meditative mystical experience is because the, the the ego is responding to the what is in that way and in the beginning before your entire body mind is dissolved it's going to experience a lot of like crazy energetic shifts or like your mind is going to put a lot of stories on top of that be like wow i'm accessing this crazy deep experience like i'm in the godhead like like i access like the seventh genre this is fucking crazy but then you're actually just allowing the what is to unfold and the what is by itself when you truly become the what is when you truly dissolve into that force of the universe it doesn't really feel like meditation anymore but at the same time it's meditation 24 7. that's just concepts that even meditation is just a concept meditation versus not meditation being in a state of absorption or not that 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 there's still a duality there Even like what I'm doing with like coaching meditation, it's a little bit like it's, it's a little bit that's why I call it like consciousness coaching. Yeah, it's kind of like you tweaking people's minds so they can be aligned, right? So when you do physical therapy, I guess you, you're tweaking their muscles so they can, like, you know, get into the zone, you know? Yeah, hug one of them, it's fucking mind blowing. You got enlightened. Oh, who got enlightened? I did. I mean, you hug one of the brown women. You, you hug a brown thing, you get enlightened? You hug one of the brown women, man. They're like Asian and brown. Now they're reproduced by. By making whole universes. You no, know, when I was going through the process, you can actually hear and feel your brain getting rewired. Yeah, it's like a very physical thing. It's almost like God is doing chiropractic practices on you. You know, flipping and switching the buttons on the circuit board of consciousness until it completely deconstructs itself, and then you're aligned with uh, reality. Been a lot of talk about like morality and ethics and like realization. You know, some teachers definitely have like really deep, you know, insights and realizations. They might even be like fully awake or whatever that means, but they still do like shady things. They still like, you know, abuse their powers. Like, why is that? Blah, blah, blah. Well, do you expect your personal trainer to like be a good person? Most of the time, no. Like, you don't want him to be like a psycho, like a, like a serial killer for sure, but like, why does it matter what he does in his personal life? You want your guru to be like this perfect being, but there's no such thing, right? A meditation coach can bring you to the non-dual state, but you probably shouldn't ask him for advice about like how to be a better husband. Like, you know what I mean? Like maybe you can, but like they're related, but not like, they're not like a direct causation really. But I would say for most people, if you become a, if you're in a non-dual state, you're just automatically, spontaneously gonna be more loving. Mm -hmm. but but that's not always the case some people become bigger assholes after realization because they just don't give a fuck <laughs> there's no there's no ego stopping them from like the, a lot of times when you try to be a very compassionate person especially before the non-dual state is it's still coming from the self yeah so but i'll say like 90 percent of the time if you become non-dual you become more more loving and more compassionate for sure but it's not like a direct causation especially if you put someone in, in a position of power uh it's hard to say what you're gonna do you know like the body still responds to certain stimuli you know you you still prefer even if you become super enlightened you still prefer good food over like dog shit obviously the body still has some, some of his biological conditioning so if you put a, a person in a non-dual state in that position who knows what you're gonna do if you're in that position? You know Shenzhen, right? Yeah, I love Shenzhen. Yeah, because he's been working on some device to like stimulate the brain using sound waves, and I think I think to kind of like hyper boost practice, like to help you know. Yeah, yeah I've been following his work for a while. Like I, I don't know too much about the specific of that work, but I know he's working on this alignment cap for like years. It's possible to just zap yourself into non-duality. Maybe not. Maybe not 
which is one time maybe you have to like keep doing it i don't know how that's going to work out but even if you do get into non-duality very quickly you still need as much time to integrate the the non-duality and you know, shizhen himself said it took him like 10 years to really feel liberated yeah because like angela said in his book you know um there is a difference between awakening and liberation mm. yeah awakening is when you first um get into non-duality when you first make that permanent switch into non-duality but then after that there, there's still going to be like nukes and crannies of the the, the body's conditioning that are slowly going to be sucked into the the infinite so to speak that process takes time that, that it's not going to just be like boom like that ramana mahashi is probably like the only person who just like become liberated the, the, the moment he became awakened he became liberated because he was like fucking 15 years old he didn't have much conditionings <laughs> Right? right so he was right. like just like a freak of nature in that in that sense but for most people it still takes a few years to like really align every particle in your being to integrate that non-dual state and, and, and let that insight let that insight seep into every single cell in your body that that takes time that's not gonna just be like on and off switch yeah so imagine you're just burning your coals right and then the moment that the coals are light out on fire that's your moment of enter non-duality or awakening and a lot of people are like you know how do i know if i enter non-duality <laughs> bro you know <laughs> it's gonna be that most obvious thing you ever experienced you know for most people it's on and off switch um if you have any doubts about it any questions whether you're non-duality or not then chances are you're not there yet after the cold stop burning we just turn to a, like a cold stone that's when uh liberation happens so you can say non-duality inter non-duality is only the beginning process of your spiritual realization so you can also say that's the difference between say an arha and a buddha i had a i had a mushroom experience years ago where i experienced a cessation oh. like a full-on like I, I, I recall the last inhale and everything went white but then everything disappeared mm -hmm. it was like it was the last thing i perceived and then disappeared time disappeared and then eventually the sense of self started to reconstruct back mm -hmm. so i remember having that experience but i didn't feel like overly different <laughs> so i was like when people talk about cessations in, in, in meditation which i don't think i've ever had it, it feels like there's a difference it's like like i, I, I experienced it mm -hmm. it felt very real but it seemed to lack the insight it was like a, i didn't feel like i got spat out the other side different you know but i it, it, it sure did feel like moment by moment experientially like a like a genuine cessation I've talked to a few people who had cessations on psychedelics, uh, um, and they do have com some insights, uh, but then it's not fully locked. It's not a permanent shift because um, the psychedelic gave them the boost to experience that cessation. So, like, my advice for people like that is to um, to see if you can repeat it, or if you want to do if you want to do psychedelics and, and, and attain cessations, you can, but maybe try to do it less and less and less. It's kind of like running with the parachute, or like you know, benching with like. I don't know uh, what the best metaphor is, but um, yes. or like when you take steroids to get big, maybe that's fine. But then maybe you want to take less and less each cycle, whatever. Yeah. It's kind of like that, yeah. Um, but but I would say that even if you do uh, attain a, a cessation naturally, um, the first cessation isn't going to do all that much actually. Like uh, my first cessation, which um, which uh, perpetuated me to stream entry on my second retreat. Afterwards, I did realize I did notice a pretty big shift. Um, but that I was only like 5% of what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm experiencing right now. But even that 5%, from my perspective now, it didn't feel like much of a change. But at that time, it felt like there was, it wasn't like truly mind-blowing, but it was mind-blowing enough for me to realize that was a, a legit uh, cessation. Um, but even after that, I still went through cycles and cycles of dark night, and there was still a lot of solidities and... So the, I would say like, uh, Daniel Ingram in his book, he said that even after stream entry, like, your moment to moment walking around perception uh, isn't shifted all that much you, yeah so sometimes you can suffer even more because now like the dark night stuff and other traumas and conditioning you know, like surfaces even more quickly and more, even they, they, they are experiencing even more raw and stuff with, with less filters and uh, it's not until like third path like i don't really care about paths anymore but just for the sake of this conversation if you want to talk about sensations uh it's not until like third path um in my stages of awakening map was like you know the the, the the god consciousness phase where i truly experienced like moment to moment experience walking around experience like really different 
it was like every moment you were just doing like the laundry you'd be like wow i'm tripping on acid or something but then if there's still someone in there there's still some solidity in the center that's experiencing that that's perceiving like oh this is trippy but then like after fourth path even that's dissolved and it's just the, the what is 